friends. I'm Sabrina, the rookie around here. John and Dick are the old school American fans of F1. Thanks for taking time to listen in on a conversation that I had with a special person connected to this podcast. You've heard each of the guys F1 origin stories. Well, they decided I needed a turn in the hot seat too and enlisted the big gun for this. My best friend and John's daughter, Rachel. So settle in to hear my F1 origin story. Warning you now, Rachel and I definitely laugh a lot together and definitely enjoy talking with one another. Hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey friends. No, that's not Sabrina's voice you're hearing. I'm Rachel. I am Sabrina's best friend. I am also John's daughter. Today, there are no guys allowed. It's only two girls talking Sabrina's backstory on Formula One. This is a delight for me to be in the position of asking all the questions. I can tell you that Sabrina is pretty nervous about this. She likes to be the one asking questions, not on the receiving end, right in the spotlight. But you know, my friend, it's your turn. You've done it to the guys and turn about spare play, isn't it? (laughs) Yes. Uh, This will be a very interesting conversation to say the least, because I'm getting the sense that you are already having way too much fun. You know, you give me a mic and you allow me to tease you about something that I grew up being around. Of course, of course, I'm going to do that. So, you know, no more, no more two guys today, guys, dad and Dick, you guys are out. It's just us girls talking about race cars. Cause what else is natural from two girls who grew up in Texas than to talk about race cars, right? That's right. Oh, <laughs> Much less goodness. formula one. Let's, let me say this. We're probably going to be the longest of the three interviews because I'm you and I can right. definitely talk. We enjoy it. Your husband okay. knows that. So that gets us to the first question of, you know, first of all, and of course, some of these things I know, and I'll just tell the audience that it really is funny to have seen Sabrina grow into this because she didn't even know what Formula One was. And now you're like obsessed. But how (laughs) did you how did you figure out what Formula One was? And how did you get interested in it, Sabrina? The easy answer is you and in a larger scale, it's your dad. You and I became friends as adults. And in that, I think one thing we learn as adults when we want to become friends with people is an intentional effort to understand who that person is, what makes them tick and And not just the stuff implicitly because of maybe your personalities or where you are in life that make you click, but also trying to better understand your friend. It was probably, I would say at least 10 years ago when in our friendship, because we've known each other, what, 20 something years now? 20 20 plus. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of telling people (laughs) our age a little bit if they do the math, but we won't give them too many more details other than that. We've known each other since we were four. Yes. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Yeah. 24. (laughs) I love it. Um, so I think it was probably 10 years into our friendship when I actually started becoming more curious. I feel like you probably said something in the early years, but I just, because I'm so not a sports person, I really probably didn't pick up on it or wasn't that inquisitive. Plus that was a different stage in my life. I think it just wasn't something that it was on my much of a radar. I may, I knew it was there. You didn't have much time for when you were doing school for anything besides school. That's true. So yeah, that's true. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, you were the one that helped me get through a lot of those years of feeling like that would never end, but yeah. So I think it was a conversations that over time, there's not a day I could like specifically pinpoint, but I just think it would be, you'd mention something or some story from your childhood on the, in the racing world, watching your dad race or hearing stories stories about your parents and how they pursued your dad's dream. I think that's when I became aware of Formula One. Okay. And I do think it was a couple of years ago, you got like really into it. Anybody listening knows that Sabrina has a really analytical mind. And she started asking me all these questions about Formula One. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I grew up with racing, but, and I like watching Formula One, but it was kind of my dad's thing, you know, like, I'm like, I don't know, go ask my dad. And now look, you did. And now here you are. (laughs) That's the truth. Yeah. I feel like I would pester you all the time. Like, so Fernando Alonso, who's that? And like, and I was like, he's a hot story. Spanish driver. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if 
funniest thing. I remember you would tell me, oh, he's so hot. And I'd be going, well, yeah, he's kind of cute, but I want to understand like how he's driving and like what his story is and how he got involved. And you'd be like, I don't know, but that would be probably one of, I, I feel like six years ago is when my interest really started to pay attention. And about a couple of years ago is when I just feel like I went down the rabbit hole as oh, I like totally. to tell people. Yeah. Don't totally you down the rabbit hole. Yeah. That sounds right. So what is it about formula one that interests you the most? Like what's your favorite thing? Oh, I think based off of the conversations, the guys would probably say, um, because I'm a Charles fan girl is because he's a cute young kid, but yeah. that's totally <laughs> not why. And you know that I love it. One, I think it's, it's the interplay of individual personal discipline and excellence inside of a team. Most people, I think when they look at Formula One or just racing, think it's just about fast cars. But when you start to go down layers, you start to realize it's not just an exceptionally skilled driver that makes the team or makes the success of winning, but you have to have the team and you have to have all the people, the right people on that team, all working towards one vision. You have to have the resources. You have to have the design, the engineering, the science. And I'm so not a STEM girl at all, but I have such respect for the people people who do like to realize like I think when Dick has some of his points about the arrow and all the different stuff if people could see my face I'm like trying so hard to follow because that's so not my norm way of thinking I'm a very analytical as you said but not in the science world it's all about logic and stuff like that I you know math other... is not your favorite I do know that's this. right <laughs> I told your dad the other day, I said, I'm so not the numbers girl. Please That's don't right. ever expect me to be that person. Yeah. So I think that also increases my respect when I realize the level of excellence that is required to even be a part of a Formula One team, be it the people, the engineers, the mechanics, and even the people inside of marketing, all of that, you have to be at the top of your game. And as a person who believes in excellence, I think that was something that that was super attractive to me to see this in a different realm than what I had ever really considered or thought of. And that really took time to pay attention more than just looking at the cars going fast and to realize, yeah. and that was probably some of the conversations you and I had when I started watching races and I, and I would hear the commentary and you would kind of drop those hints and little nuggets, which then would make me go home and want to explore that more and read up that's when the questions started to come that makes sense it's a very typical sabrina response and i mean at the end of the day like and we've talked about this you know when you first got into it, but because i grew up with it but formula one in particular but road racing i don't know of anything more exciting the adrenaline of that when you're there but then you start to realize and i learned a lot of that from dad the discipline of it and the you're right the teamwork and the strength both physically and mentally and emotionally that the drivers have to have but it's funny you approach it in such a typically sabrina way because you got excited about it and then yeah you just went and you've learned everything you could about it and absorbed all of this info knowing that you've gone down that rabbit hole and looked at all mm -hmm. the stuff what do you think is the most surprising thing so far i don't think until we probably even started this podcast and i realized the calendar of f1 especially with 23 races and the content creation we're trying to do for the podcast i don't think i fully had empathy for what's happening amongst the teams, amongst anybody part of that traveling circus. As the audience member, you're especially those of us who haven't gone to a race, you, you're just watching it on TV. You just turn it on and then it's there and you get to enjoy it and then you turn it off. But you don't necessarily think about everything that's happening every day, all day long across the globe to make this happen, be it the logistics to move the stuff to one location to the other that you know they're handed off by the team to a logistics delivery to the person who's in charge of food delivery and food preparation for the team to ensure that there's healthy food for the team members and then you think about all the front front aspects the driver and all that and how much dedication they have to have to be at the level of skill that they need to be every time they go out to race. I think that that kind of endurance 
and discipline was as I unpacked it, I intellectually knew it. But now with us trying to match that in our little way, I think it surprised me how exhausting that can be. And it just all only made me want them more. Right? Yes. Yes. It's very consuming. Like you're you're I find myself because as you know, I'm so information gathering kind of person. I'm like constantly reading articles and listening to other podcasts and commentary to better understand. And I realize that's my little way of being a part of F1, but I can't even imagine for the rest of those people who are doing the actual F1 experience that we as spectators get to enjoy Yeah, what that must be like. And I can see where the burnout that I have heard about, the challenges that they have, I have a greater level of empathy, I think, especially when I also talk to your dad and to Dick and I hear from them a different side, I realize there's so much more than we as fans may truly give credit, which is one of the reasons why I enjoy our conversations, because hopefully those who are listening will have even more appreciation for everyone who makes F1 possible. Yeah. I've enjoyed that in listening to y'all's podcast too, as far as there are I think in any, almost anything in life, but especially in a lot of business ventures, there's always a lot of people behind the scenes doing a lot of the work, but it's interesting to hear about all those different facets. And it's exciting to think about how American fans can get involved in F1. I mean, you could do, yes, you could talk about mechanics. You could do carding stuff. There's also the business aspect of it. There's the sponsorship part of it, right? There's so many pieces, there's advertising. So that's interesting to see all of that. Um, Mm -hmm. what about, so, you know, formula one is the whole, there's a lot of lessons that can transfer. I know you looked at that, but what about other sports? Now (laughs) I know you pretty well listeners. We're kind of music people. This is how Sabrina and I met. So sports (laughs) and we live in Texas, it should be football, but, um, are there any sports that you like besides formula one and any (laughs) sports that you do? (laughs) (laughs) I think you know the answer, but we're doing this as a courtesy to the rest of the listeners. So are there any other sports? Not really. I don't really care. I mean, I can sit at a baseball game and enjoy a baseball game, but am I following the schedule? No, not really. I know I use, I have no clue when it comes time for the Super Bowl, who in the world is at the Super Bowl. I usually find out at the Super Bowl party who in the world is playing. If I were, I would say I enjoy games like cricket. Uh, I think that that's a very fascinating game as well. But baseball and cricket probably are the two that I would watch intentionally, but not to the level of my excitement for F1. Like my I really am. I really and truly try to build my time around being able to view F1 races and free practice and quality as much live as possible or as quickly Mm -hmm. after it happens. I know that my family thinks I'm kind of insane because I'm getting up at two or three (laughs) in the morning for some of these things. But I find that especially for someone like me who likes to gain information, I actually enjoy watching free practice because I can see and hear things without the excitement of the race. And I find that uh, Formula One as a commentator's they give a lot of information that I can just listen to. So sometimes this is, this is so funny. You'll, you, you will know this. Um, I'll listen to it while I'm laying in bed and it may be two in the morning and just kind of like have it playing and listen or while I'm working, I have it playing in the background. And then I'll, when they say, Oh, look at this. And then I'll pause and I'll go and look at that. So that's kind of the way that I've tried to assimilate as quickly as possible um, information. No, it's definitely true. We kind of have to plan uh, if we're going to get together, we have to look at the formula one uh, schedule and see when that's going to be happening. And I remember you talking about watching quality and I'm like, you, you got into this about the time that we had kids. I was like, you're just going to have to catch me up on what's going on because I do not have time. <laughs> so that worked out well because I knew what was going on just through you. But yeah, you uh, definitely Formula One is the uh, sport that you kind of eat, sleep and breathe right now. Um, mm-hmm. So another funny thing as you got into Formula One, I saw you start to drive a little faster yourself, my friend. Really? I'm the the daughter of John Duke. So of course I love this. People should always drive faster in our opinion. You know, everybody in our family, our excuse for speeding tickets is it's dad's fault because he taught us how to drive fast. (laughs) But 
what do you say to somebody who thinks that formula one is just about driving fast and about fast cars? Oh no. I think it's definitely a lack of going deeper and that yes, at the very basic level, it's fast cars, but it's engineering. I think that's something even this last year I've seen more and more with the rules and how the implication of the rules. I don't necessarily know that in past years, I would have understood that, but the rules change shows you that in, in practice. Um, I think it goes back to what I said about teamwork and individual discipline, because like what we're seeing now, you can have excellent driver, but if the car isn't there, then his skill is kind of squandered. Or if you have a driver who isn't an excellent car, but he's not doing, he's not matching the car's performance. That's also disappointing. And yeah. it, it it's also, um, I think the psychological aspect of it. And um, it's also an amazing business. I think most people fail to realize what big business it is and the politics of it. And, just also the economic value that it brings to a given community. Those are all things that I think that when we, when we step away and look at the larger picture and just evaluate it for what it's bringing each week that we have it, it's kind of amazing. I would totally agree with that. You know, we grew up watching formula one and there is, there's a rich history there that we saw also, As Americans, I love the fact that you can see other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, my husband's from Belgium. We love, he loves watching the Belgian race. We get to see his home country and, and it's, it's pretty, it's, you know, Mm -hmm. some of these tracks are impressive tracks and it's also just pretty. So that's just a perk to me, but you're right. It's much more than about fast cars because it was just about fast cars. Anybody could get behind the wheel and do it. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. Oh, and that's a great point about the beauty of the places that you get to see. I was watching the Baku race with some friends who have never paid attention to motorsport, let alone formula one. And that was the thing that they kept pointing out. Wow. We're getting to see all this beautiful scenery around as it's clipping, you know, flipping back and forth, especially during free practice. Cause I made them watch all of that with me that weekend when we were all hanging I'm, out. I'm shocked, shocked. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, it's, it's like a, a little transportation away from yourself out of wherever you live to someplace different into a whole different world with a lot of discipline. And you brought up the mental preparation. That's one thing that I became aware of as dad was in the sport. And that really is one that just has always impressed me. It's the, not just the physical discipline, which is insane, but Mm -hmm. the mental part of it um, and what it takes for people to get to that level and, and how many people it takes to get there. I find that fascinating just from a, I guess, a human standpoint of how do we, a psychology standpoint of how do you get people to get to that next level or to perform at this high level and and be successful. You know, we're going to shift gears, ha ha, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I I keep thinking as we've kind of talked through some of these questions, I keep thinking of, I think it's Nico Rosberg. Isn't he the one that retired after he had Mm -hmm. won the championship? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He just talked about former Lewis's former teammate. Yeah. And he Mm -hmm. talked about how, he, he said, I know I've been a champion. I know what it takes to be a champion. I've done it. Now I want to go on and live my life. That is a really great summation of the formula one world. I think, you know, he's, mm-hmm. and he's now he's still involved. He does interviews and things like that, but he, he's just stuck in my mind as we've talked about some of these questions. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. There you go. Well, yeah. But, Cause I think formula one creates principles in people who are engaged in it, whatever the work, whatever the role they do that are truly transferable outside of that, that industry and that world. So I could, I can see where Nico would say I've achieved the pinnacle. I'm now ready to go on and take these skills elsewhere. And we see that with, I think we'll eventually see that in a greater way, but we've already seen it with Seb. I think he's trying to take that stuff elsewhere. Absolutely. And yeah, you're right. You and I've talked about how, you know, that that's a podcast for a different uh, audience, Mm, but we've talked about some of the things in formula one and how, and just in team sports and and that sort of stuff, how it's transferable into the professional world. It's definitely, 
uh, insightful there. Now let's talk about how, you know, we in the U S have gotten really into formula one. I have to say that I, when I, I've told people about this podcast, we talk about formula one and I put a disclaimer that I was a fan of formula one before it got as popular as it is now, you know, before drive Mm -hmm. to survive and all of those Mm -hmm. things. I don't think it's a bad thing, but it was, you know, you know, it was my growing up years. It was what we mm-hmm. eat, slept and breathed for a while as kiddos. We would always be at the racetracks on the weekends, but knowing that it's expanded, what mm-hmm. are your thoughts about the changes Liberty is making? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You like it? Don't like it? What do you think? It's interesting. Cause I also give that qualifier that you do. Um, <laughs> I'm not a drive to survive fan result to F1 because it's I like- do think, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just saying, it's like we were cool before it was cool, right? Isn't that an old yeah. country song? <laughs> yeah. I think I, even, I, was, I was F1 before F1 was cool. That's right. Well, I think I said that to your dad the other day and he just chuckled. Um, so oh. yeah, I think it's interesting. Here's where I, my trajectory to F1 was already in progress when this happened. So I think I want to make sure that it's it's distinct, but I don't dislike what's happening with with a um drive to survive and i realize that it comes as a result of many of the efforts that liberty is making i don't know that if i had watched because of who i am i don't necessarily know that if i had actually clicked onto the netflix series it would have resonated with me i just i'm not a person who goes looking for drama if anything i'm always trying to bring down the volume of drama in my life and most stuff that i tend to watch on streaming services tend to be like fictional or documentaries like kind of the either end of those extremes i really probably only started watching it because i started hearing people talk about it in the f1 world kind of in a derogatory term and I thought well I better go watch it I watched it and I didn't dislike it but I didn't like it either because when you it's kind of like what is I'm trying to think of the analogy it's it's like you get something that is just a little slice Mm. of the of the bigger thing that you know is so much better and you're going well I already have the be- the better option. I don't really need to go and take the lesser one. But if all that you've ever been introduced to is Drive to Survive and that now gets you into the world of Formula One, I don't begrudge that. Like, I think that's great. I think it's wonderful that Americans are starting to realize the sport exists and that this world of motor racing is fairly substantial and lengthy in history and that it's global and this in in an era right now where I feel like the world is so divided not just in our country but over around the globe we're all just so yeah I would love to see something like this bring people together like I think it's to me Formula One sometimes feels like what I would hope the Olympics can do every four years but Formula One can do every year is this patriotism in a healthy way, this pride of, of excellence, people going for their dreams. I mean, who wouldn't want to cheer on somebody like that? That's encouraging to all of us to go yeah. out and pursue our dreams and to do our best and to work well with others and, and to have competitiveness in a healthy way, you know, like, yeah. so in that sense, I like, I do appreciate that a vehicle has been given as an on-ramp for Americans to join into the world of F1. Cause of course we've had things like NASCAR and IndyCar, which are all great. I've never really had any interest to watch any of that. And I think that what I like about formula one is the fact that the reach is so substantial and I can connect. Like I have a cousin in England who watches it. I have family that live in the middle East. I have family that live in Australia, you know, like some of them are F1 fans and some of them have absolutely no clue. They were like me 10 years ago. So (laughs) I could see that eventually more and more people knowing about it would be something that would bring a sense of, Hey, we're in this together. we let's enjoy this together. I love that. The idea of it being like the Olympics, of course, you know, I'm biased because I've always grown up watching it and really love it, but I, I hadn't really thought of that. And I think it's a good point that it's, I'm trying to think of any other sport. I mean, I have friends in the States who follow the English football. I have to say that's mm-hmm. so we know it's not the American football, 
Mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, the most I know about that is from watching Ted Lasso, like mm-hmm. it's, it's harder to get in even football, I think is kind of centralized to Europe. It's not, I don't think Australia has football leagues, but formula one does have that ability to be a global mm-hmm. connection point. And I think, you know, things like drive to survive and Liberty's efforts, it, it is a, it's a jumping off point. And mm-hmm. so it, it is exciting to see Americans get more involved in it. Yeah. And for something as complex and as technical as F1 is, I think the beauty of Drive to Survive is that it does remind you that there are human beings involved. And I like the way that they they try to pull back the curtain so it doesn't feel so intimidating to try to understand it. Because yeah. the basic storylines that are created, I think help you to go, oh, okay, I can approach this sport and not feel like I have to know everything. What's an outlap and what is, you know, the various flags and all that kind of stuff can be super intimidating to people if they're just all of a sudden turning on ESPN and they see that and they have no motorsport background. But Drive to Survive makes it where at least you can sit down and enjoy the race at the very minimum and have somebody to cheer on or a team to cheer on. Like, I think that's a very good thing. So people are more invested in it Mm -hmm. as a result. And some of that is just we, in this day and age, we like the personal connection. We like knowing people's stories, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, it may not be the way it's always been. Dad and Dick may have different opinions, but it is something that is appealing to audiences and gets them more invested and involved. So yeah. if I'm a new fan, mm-hmm. and I, maybe I've watched Drive to Survive or I've watched some races. Maybe I've got a crazy friend like you that's trying to get me into Formula <laughs> One. What do you think is the critical viewing or reading? Now, knowing, here's my caveat, that mm-hmm. not everybody is going to spend as much time and go down <laughs> the rabbit hole as deeply as you have done. <laughs> what do you think? Where should they start? What do they need to make sure they watch or listen to or you know read? That's a, that's a good uh, caveat that you put on there. Cause I can list <laughs> about 50 million of them. Like, and people don't realize that's probably how many resources oh, I've gathered. That really is um, true. Give me like your top <laughs> five. How about that? Well, so I think book wise, if you like books, formula one has about one, two, three, four, I'm look. I'm turning over my shoulder to look at my library. Um, there are about six books that I found that are essentially formula one, I guess maybe Liberty Media, but it's a guy named Maurice Hamilton seems to be the main author. And it's beautiful photography inside of their photographs from like the 1930s. But it's a series of different topics. Like it's one is the history. Another one is about the champions of F1. The circuits that F1 like has had and or has, because there are not all circuits have are that have been raced on are still in use yeah Um, there's also i'm trying to see here what they call the mavericks some of the people who really changed the face of f1 i think that that series of books is super helpful like i went and read about fangio and like um graham hill and all these people from eras that we we just don't really hear talked about, even if you're watching the races and the commentaries, unless you have someone like a Martin Brundle or a Jackie Stewart come on, there's really not often time. I don't think it's there. don't want to talk about it. There's just not enough time. No, you're in the midst of that race. Come on now. We can't talk about history. Have a history Correct. Lesson. Correct. So but to have Maurice, an appreciation, yeah, Maurice oh, sorry, Hamilton, Maurice yeah. Hamilton um, okay. is pretty much the consistent guy who writes all of it. Different people are coming in and co-writing it with him. But what I love about it is that to have an appreciation of where Formula One is today, I think you have to understand where it started, how the cars originally, how, what did the term formula mean and why, what, um, like Formula Libre, I think is one of the ones where it was very basic rules, very general, mm-hmm. and how much um, flexibility was given for the constructors. And like that in and of itself was very illuminating to realize what I see now is all of these rules and they even go to 
lawsuits over some of this stuff to realize that the beginning stages it was people sitting on hay bales on the side of streets as these yes. cars were going you know like that's really kind of cool and realizing the level of danger that people are putting in and i know for people who have listened to dick's backstory he talks about that in some of the movies that um he recommended that people watch the yeah. other thing that i would recommend to any person who is getting involved is actually to go find youtube And put in questions that you have about a term or a concept. And there are some exceptionally good Formula One focused YouTube channels. I'm trying to think of one. One guy is based out of Australia. I don't have the link, but I could probably put that into the show notes. Um, I think his name is, I think his channel is called Perspective. The other one is CY Motorsports. He does a really great job. He's based out of the U.S. There's a couple of podcasts that I listen to almost religiously. I love Beyond the Grid with Tom Clarkson. I'm a bit of a fangirl of Tom Clarkson. I know that's a journalist, yeah, but I've noticed um, that. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 I think he's an exceptional journalist when it comes to F1. The way he just lets the the person he is interviewing go where they where they want to go. He's just it's clear he's very comfortable with the topic. And then there's also the F1 Nation that I find that when they do theirs, it's a hodgepodge of different people. That's really great. And Sky Sports has a podcast that I also think is very good of a, it's usually three to four people that are on the virtual panel that'll talk about whatever has happened this week. And so I, I think this is, again, another thing that I think Liberty Media has done well in pushing the sport to have more content created for those of us who are coming in. And you just have to take the time to figure out which one suits your style of knowledge gathering and like who you like to listen to. But I think that they have done a good job of also putting a diverse group of voices that represent F1 people who are former drivers, people who are journalists who love the sport. Um, I think that helps again as an equalizer for those of us who are coming in. Yeah, we're definitely, we're seeing more women, which is exciting. Mm-hmm. Again, as somebody who's been around this for uh, well, only about 20 years, right? Because I'm only 24, <laughs> but yes, it's exciting to see the diversity that the that they're bringing. So that's nice. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about just this podcast in general a little bit, which mm-hmm. was, which was my dad's kind of idea. Dad's a big idea person. <laughs> that is and then, true. So why? Did you accept the invitation? And I'll just add the funny story. So Sabrina and I have known each other a long time. She's known my folks a long time. And she said, I'm going to do this with your dad. I'm going to have to call him John. And I was like, <laughs> yep, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I was telling him the other day and I was telling your mom, I said, I think I finally have gotten comfortable calling him John after this many months of doing this. Um, so why did I accept the invitation? I think at the very basic level, I was very honored that they would choose to ask me. I know both of them have very deep Rolodexes of people both in and out of the sport. And the fact that they would invite me to be a part of it, I was like, yeah, thank you so much. And then the byproduct of it is it's conversations where I get to learn. And what I don't, what I hope that even when I do the intros, people realize that it's intentional that I say, listen in, because these are conversations that John and I would have had, um, regardless of whether or not a microphone was in front of our faces because I would go to him with these questions. Yeah. And then go go ask dad. And you did. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like I would, I would send him messages before and after races and like, okay, what, what is this? I'm hearing, you know, that. So (laughs) in that sense, it was like, well, why not? Maybe there are other people like me who need to have something that is because some of the podcasts that are out there expect a level of technical understanding that I don't have. Some podcasts I think that are out there are such that it's more about the drama 
And I'm not saying that either of those are wrong. I think that's great. Let's, they should be out there and enjoy that segment of the market. I think for us, I think we were wanting to find kind of for people like me who were, who are saying, I really want to dive deep, but I, I don't know where. And to make it approachable was our goal. And so mm-hmm. when, when they said that it would be two guys and a girl, I thought, I also like that. It shows, and we're intergenerational. I love that. The main equalizer is all three of us are from Texas. Everything else, our three backgrounds are very different. And I think there's a lot of mutual respect. I'm, I'm grateful that he invited me to be a part of this. Well, I, it's been really fun to hear you guys talk. I mean, basically everybody listening to the podcast gets to listen to what I was listening to you and dad talk about. And Dick does add <laughs> some fun uh, nuggets. He adds some great stories and his perspective is very fun to listen to. I think I kind of know the answer to this question. I think that you would hope that listeners would take away a better understanding of the sport, hopefully a more in-depth or broader perspective yeah. of Formula one what else what else are you hoping people get from this podcast i think that's it is like if someone listens to you you know some of our conversations can be as short as like 30 minutes but most of them can be up to 60 we try to be at 45 but you know we all are just enjoying our conversation i'd love if someone says i'm listening to this while i do x you know chore you know, maybe yeah. folding, folding their laundry. And I just enjoy having you guys talk to me, talk and me getting to listen in and learn something new about the sport. So that way, the next time I go watch the race or next week's race, I have a better understanding, or I was questioning this call, you know, and John and Dick really helped us to see why this decision was made by uh, by a team to do x or for the stewards to make this decision or penalty that kind of thing i think what it does is it gives back to the sport and it helps people to feel like they have a seat you know not, it's not like you have to be sitting on the grass to you can be having a seat in a grandstand you know virtual of enjoying yeah a comfortable spot and knowing that you're a welcomed part of this community. That's a very typical Sabrina answer. You find something, you love it. You want to share it with others. Oh, so. <laughs> thank you. I love that. Well, what do you think that uh, dad and Dick bring to this conversation? I, I, I have smart aleck answers like their, their years of experience and <laughs> their, you know, amazing wit, but <laughs> I'm teasing them a little bit, but what, what do you think about the two of those guys together and what they bring to this podcast and to the conversation? Yeah, I think they're <clears throat> the perfect complement to one another. They both have known each other for so long. So that just like, I hope that anybody listening will see you and I have a camaraderie and an understanding and a deep appreciation for each other. I, as a, as a third part of the the conversation feel that with John and Dick that they really enjoy talking and discussing F1, but even more than that, they have a very abiding friendship. And so that I think allows for them to complement each other, like a yin and a yang in the sense that I told you your dad the other day, I said, I think you approach the conversations in a very surgical way. Like you do a great job of laying the parameters of a question. Like if I ask a question and you set, set the table. And then what Dick is an amazing storyteller, which your dad and I had this conversation too, like that Dick has amazing stories and he knows how to tell it to you in a way that you're just like, wow, that's so cool. And, yeah. um, and so if, if John is coming in and setting the table, then Dick is coming in with a great appetizer and then the entree and then the dessert. You can't do one without the other, right? Like you got to have a beautifully, well, you know, beautiful, but you have to have a table set. Like you got to have the plates and all that kind of stuff to eat and in, in a group. And the flip side is you got to have to have the meal. So yes. one without the other, I don't think would make sense or be as strong as what I feel like in a hump, I'm saying this with all humility, but I feel like the, the content would not be what it is if we didn't have both of them. 
to bring that yeah. conversation. And what I love about the two of them is when I ask questions, they never make me or any other person who might be having it feel dumb. They're wanting to transfer the information that they have gained from their experiences to those of us who are new because they believe in the sport. And I think that's a commendable thing because sometimes people can be kind of like, well, you know, you just need to figure it out yourself or, well, how dumb are you for not understanding this basic concept? Well, it's not, if you haven't grown up with it, there's no reason for you to have been able to analyze and come to that same yeah. thing. Or if you've not experienced it, why would you know that answer? So I hope that that, that the audience sees and feels that just as much as I do. Yeah. I, I love the fact that you all three have such a diverse background and your backgrounds have, and your experiences with, with the racing world and with Formula One and just in life, they color all of that. So it is, it's a very rich and, and I, I, of course, again, I'm biased, but it's educational mm-hmm. and it, it is open and it's, it's, uh, I, I hope that, that comes through to people as well. Mm-hmm. We've talked that, yes, this has been a growing passion slash obsession for a few years <laughs> but what talking about this year which is so wild we're just not really that far into the racing year yet because it's such a long one but so far this year mm-hmm. which race do you think has been the best or the most maybe not the best but what's been the most interesting interesting well so I will tell you we're a third of the way mm-hmm. through so we are kind of far in um Still it's impossible Yeah. Well, I think it's because one, the volume, it just feels like, wow, there's another race. Not that I'm complaining, but it's just shocking. It's kind of great. I'm like, there's so many races. It's going to go on forever. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) What is the most interesting? I guess it depends on how we define interesting. It's your podcast. You get to define it. (laughs) That's really good. for yourself. That's right. I don't have to even defer to the guys on this one. Um, I think, well, so... Barcelona, I walked away from that race thinking it is probably, especially now that that chicane has been removed. And I said this in the, in the race debrief, I was so excited to see them come around that corner. You can't see my face, but I'm like grinning from ear to ear. Every time they came around that corner where the chicane was removed, it was like, (laughs) and you would see the fast, the speed that that car was coming around. And Mm. I just couldn't get enough of it. I mean, during free practice, it wasn't as high speeds, but during the race and the cameras would, would whip over to that spot. I was like, that is just awe inspiring to me. But if I were to talk about race wise, like, well, no, I think actually I'm going through all of them in my head. I would love to say Monaco because, you know, quality was. Oh my goodness. Exciting. So yeah. gorgeous to watch. Um, but you know what I would say the most interesting aspect of this year to me has been so far is the helicopter camera. And we saw it really obvious at Monaco, but mm-hmm. also the, the last week at um, Barcelona as well. I think it's whatever they've been doing in F1 with that camera mounted and whoever is doing the direction I think you get, if you spend time looking at it, you realize how different our perception because we're watching it on a two-dimensional screen. It enables you to have a little bit of a better idea of what these guys are going through on that race. The inclines and the turns and the speed and then like the jostling for position. I think that was this year for me so far has been the most surprising and interesting um, was the appreciation I walk away from each race after watching that camera angle specifically. Interesting. I was thinking just as, as you were talking about, that is one advantage we have, you know, I know that I I think that folks like dad and Dick who've been around in a sport may get nostalgic for certain parts of the sport, but Mm -hmm. We sure do have the technology advantage just from the viewership, not even talking about the technological advances in the cars, but Mm -hmm. dadgum, our TVs are bigger. They are better. We've got better cameras. We get a much better picture at home (laughs) than the folks 30 years ago. It's pretty incredible. There were hardly any races to watch 
you know, I don't know about you, but we had one of those silly dial TVs growing up. So it was not as good of a picture as we've got now <laughs> to That's appreciate right. those camera well, angles. <laughs> I mean, even that 19, what is it? 1989 Senna at Monaco race, like the, when he's doing the the lap and you're watching it it's so i mean i'm not taking knocking anything senna did but the quality of the video if we is nothing compared to what we see on the regular onboard cameras and then now with f1 tv you can go and watch the entire race from the perspective of any of the drivers which again because i go down that rabbit hole i tend to watch this afterwards because i want to hear what the engineers were saying the strategists were saying what was the driver saying half the time it's really quiet because he's staying focused but then when he starts talking you know you want to go well why is he talking what is he saying and what is that trying to what should we be what could i be learning from what he's seeing as the driver yeah. that i think is truly a like you said, the technological advancement, which that's another thing that I love about F1 is that it pushes advancement in ways that maybe the general public non-F1 world may not realize the innovation that happens inside of F1 that transfers into other aspects of our life. I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, no, I agree. All right. So we've talked about the races so far this year. Mm -hmm. But we know you haven't been to a live Formula One race yet. So if you could pick, you know, this is, I mean, you can't answer all of them, which would probably be dad's answer. I don't know if Dick would answer <laughs> it way, but they'd probably say all of them. I want to go to every single one. Can't answer that. But pick your top, like money is no object. Time is no object. Jet lag is no object. What's the race you want to go see in person? Just one. I'll give you your top three. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. You knew I couldn't do it down to one. So, um, yeah, I think this might surprise our audience that I've never actually been to a race period, like any kind of motor race. Everything that I know about motor racing is what I've watched um, online or on my TV. Mm. Uh, so if I were to look at just F1 Grand Prix, I think it would be... Coda, Silverstone, and I'm back and forth on number three. And your husband would probably push me over to the side of the one that I'm going <laughs> to list, which is Spa. I also would love if I could find a way. I would like to put Spa and Suzuka on the same level, but we'll get okay. since you said three, I'll let you have a tie put, for three. That's fine. I think you good. can get a a cheat for you always work around it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think that um, Coda is just a fantastic track, especially when I read about like the design des- decisions that were made and that it was based on some of the more historic tracks and the intentionality. And then I just, maybe because it's here in our backyard, I just really can't wait to, to get to go to Coda for okay. a Grand Prix weekend. Silverstone, I love it because of the fact that it's the historic race and where most would say F1 began. Um, And then spa. So I did sim racing. So even though I've not done racing and been in a racetrack, I did do sim racing. And when I did that, I asked to, let's see, I did Silverstone and and spa. And when I did silver, I mean, spa and I did Eau Rouge, I like about flipped out because I was like, oh, now I get it. And that's just sim racing. And I understand now, like my appreciation again for the drivers went out the roof because if a sim was that hard and they actually said I did pretty good for a first timer, um, I just really thought, wow, what will it be like? I would love to go and see that, that track. Okay. Well, I, you know me, I'm always up for a trip, so let's just figure out and we're going to have to start saving our pennies. But uh, <laughs> That's right. I know you would put Monaco at the list. I would, you know, it's just the history of it uh, for me, but I am my mother's daughter too. And 
take me anywhere to travel and I will go and you can throw a formula one race in there. I'm good. Let's, let's let the boys get a little bit older and then we'll just travel to all the formula one races all over the world. How about that? I love that. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe the F1 people will hear this and, you know, help us out on that one. I mean, we'll sponsor. We've got cute little twin boys who would love to go see the formula one races. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> that right. is funny that you, you know, this, that, uh, the boys really don't watch TV because they're, I mean, they're only three, but they do get to watch formula one races. They kind of even know they ask if there's a race on for the weekend or not, they want to watch it. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, they have we're their getting priorities right. involved. That's right. That's right. That's right. So races you want to go see good. Mm-hmm. What about, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm doing like the evil fingers. How about getting you into some uh, performance driving to give you a feel for how fast the F1 drivers are doing? And if you don't want to even drive, how about we just stick you in a car with dad or Dick and let them you know, go 100, 150 <laughs> around the course? What do you think? Yeah, that sounds like a question that Dick would pose um, to me. You know, I told them because they both had talked about this. I said, you know, maybe if we get a thousand subscribers, I would I would get into one I because. First off, let's let's put a challenge to everybody. The second part is I would love to get behind. As you noted, I have increased my speed in driving. I my sister calls me an aggressive chicken. I always tell her, well, it's the chicken is because I don't trust any of the other people on the road. Um, but I know that like I would do well if I'm given instruction, I think. And so if I was put on a controlled track or area protected and given some good instruction, I want to believe I could do a good job. I just like to film that. So I'll just say, if you guys get to a thousand followers, I'll make (laughs) sure that we've got really good video equipment and we'll put you in the wheel of that car and, you know, we'll give you some instruction You definitely didn't grow up with John Duke who just put you out on some ice when it iced over in Texas and made you go into a spin. So you'll seriously, I didn't know that story. Rena. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Well, I don't, I think we've talked about this. Like when I turn, you know, you start learning to drive, you're 15, you get your learner's permit. I never, I was terrified of driving with dad because he was very, I mean, he was never mean about it, but he's very good at driving. So that's mm-hmm. intimidating for somebody who's just learning. And we would go through intersections and he would say, okay, what color was that truck back there? And I'm like 15. I don't know. There was a truck. You know, he really taught me to be observant and to watch, mm-hmm. um, watch all my mirrors to watch, you know, not just what's coming up in front of you, but what's going on on the side, what's going on mm-hmm. behind you. And then mm-hmm. we did have one time where there was, you know, it's Texas. There's not a lot of ice, but we had a, a year that it iced over and we went out to one of the parking lots over by the mm-hmm. local elementary school. And mm-hmm. he made John and I both uh, turn the car until it started to slide. And then made, he wanted us to feel what it felt like and then get out of it, you know? Mm. So um, that's, that's actually been really, yeah. Those lessons have transferred. They transferred to my music life when I was performing Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's the idea of performing under pressure, but I, I I would, I would pay some money towards getting you into one of those performance driving situations, get it filmed. So, yeah, I would love to do that. I mean, I think that again, I think that's one of the many things when it comes to what we're talking about, about motor racing and formula one, like these are things that are lessons in life that we shouldn't discount, you know, people think of, especially in America, we think about like the other sports of football and basketball and all those, and they get a lot of attention, um, regarding the skills that can come out of, at, for any person who puts in the time to be, uh, skilled at that. But I also think that the things you just discussed are very good life lessons of how, how to perform under pressure and how to make sure that if your car literally is, is skidding, how do you deal with that? So you don't create any bigger of a tragedy, you know, on the lip, on the literal motorway. So yeah. Yeah, well, really, do, we should do, do more it. of that too. Honestly, we like, should. Everybody should know how to uh, drive more defensively than they do. I just was, I grew up with John Duke, but uh, let's put you in some performance going and yeah, film it, film it. Yeah. Thousand followers, come on, guys, thousand followers, <laughs> so I can see her scream a little bit too. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> What's the thing you most anticipate on a, a Grand Prix weekend? I mean, I know you love it all. You, mm-hmm. if you know, Sabrina really loves something if she gives up sleep to get up and watch it. And especially <laughs> when you got really down this rabbit hole, I was having like I had newborns. And I was like, "You're doing what? You're getting up at what time?" 
to do what? <laughs> no. But is it the qualifying? Is it the actual race? You know, is it watching the teams? What, what do you like? The favorite. Now you have, this is favorite. Right, or right. Or thing you look more forward to the most. So you got to pick one on this one. And I think I have come to realize more and more is that each race pushes the car, the driver, and the team to um, highlight something different about themselves. So for example, like I kind of alluded to it in the discussion at Barcelona in the introduction, that you go from Monaco to Barcelona, two very different types of tracks. And one's a street, one's a permanent track. Mm -hmm. And of course, then there were the upgrades that occur. So I think what I always look forward to is to see what am I going to learn this week? What am I going to learn about the driver, how they have adapted or how they have been affected by the last race or in the interim of things have happened? How mm -hmm. is it that um, this track is going to show us about maybe the car and its development or the the team are they working and they are they gelled or how are they going to perform so it's always kind of like that comparative analysis I guess is what I like to see and then at the end of the year especially during winter break before we start the next season I'll, I like to review some of that stuff and think about what did we forecast at the early part of the season and then how did that match up with what we ended up seeing by the end you know because we that's the thing like even where we were watching Aston right now we didn't have they didn't have the best of results this is the first time the season they didn't show up on the podium well yeah. you, you know is that the new especially when you think about last year it was around this time that charles started to have his decline as a driver like and that can you can kind of pinpoint in my opinion some of that too the calendar the track where the teams are in their development and even some of the questions that i've been trying to glean from the guys are trying to help me on that hypothesis that i haven't quite proven just yet because i don't think i have enough time uh in the sport to really make to really know i feel confident in what i am kind of perceiving but does that make sense like it's like new data each week i was just laughing you're such a goofball because your favorite thing about grand prix weekend is the analytics of it you crack me <laughs> up i love you <laughs> I'm glad you do. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, but it doesn't surprise me. It does make sense. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're getting to the end of this and okay. um, I'm going to change up the order of these questions. Let's start okay. with uh, what's your daily driver and what's your dream daily driver? What do you really drive? Oh. And then what do you wish you drove? Oh, that's a good question. So my daily driver is probably so not fancy and so very american suburban it's a honda crv so it's a small suv what would i drive my dream one that is so hard because there's one side of me that wants like a big vehicle and the other one wants a very small and i think more i would incline to a small small sports car i really love the beautiful design of a porsche yeah I think it's, girl it's so smooth and and just really gorgeous. And I'm learning to understand that a little bit better. I don't, I think it's just the, the artistic aspect of the Porsche is what it is inclined, but mm. also I've always loved um, the mini Coopers. And I think that largely resulted from the movie, the Italian job. And I watched it and saw how she could just zip and, and move all of them because zip <laughs> and move around in their little car. Yeah. And I love that idea of it yeah no so talking about mini coopers now i'm just going down a little uh -huh. tangent because you know uh -huh. dad dad and john both bought you know they had the first year really nice cooper s's they're so much fun did mm -hmm. you ever ride in the car with him did you like did he no and have you no. ever ridden with dad or dick like really taking no. you out and driving like they can mm -hmm. drive no neither one <laughs> i've never been in the car with your dad i've only been in the car with you and i think your mom I don't think mm. I've ever been in the car with any of your siblings. Okay. If, if well, I have been with one of your siblings, it would probably be your brother, John. And then no, not with Dick. I'm just thinking maybe we get to 500 uh, subscribers and maybe we put you behind the, in the passenger seat with dad and Dick and let them take you out and show you <laughs> a little bit what that feels like. 
You're just, giving these guys ideas. Oh my goodness. You don't know that there weren't phone calls before we talked. Ha ha. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Cause the first time dad was just showing us what the mini could do when he bought it and you take it out on some of the back country roads. You can have a little mm-hmm. bit of fun, Sabrina. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> 500 subscribers. We'll put Sabrina in the passenger seat and let dad and Dick take her for wild drives. Okay. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so Tell me this, oh, fangirl. I really need some people to be on Alonzo's side. Come on, guys. Well, I don't dislike Alonzo. But you don't love him the way I do. I know. That's true. And Dick. Dick is a huge Fernando fan. He calls him Fred. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So what color are Charles' eyes? Oh, have I stumped I the fangirl? You actually have stumped the fangirl. <laughs> I think they're green, but honestly, I've not really looked that closely. Because <laughs> contrary to everybody's possible perception, the reason I, I'm a fangirl of Charles is really not because he's a handsome guy. I'm not in any way detracting from his handsomeness. It's actually, I think it's his personality and his personal story. I Mm. think that I have resonated so deeply with first off, he just seems like a really good human being. Um, There's a level of humility that despite the fact that he has reached the level that he has, that he doesn't think too highly of himself. And I think it was, the, you know, the YouTuber I was talking about from Australia, he got yeah. to go to the Australian Grand Prix this year and, you know, Charles did not do well there. And he highlighted that Charles was walking through the paddock uh, after his DNF and a young kid comes up to him and keep in mind, this is demoralizing for Charles. And that kid asked for an autograph and Charles stopped He saw this with his own eyes. He said he stopped, he smiled, he took a picture and he signed the autograph for that kid and even like patted him on the head. And this, the YouTuber said he didn't have to do that. He could have totally just walked away. I mean, everybody would have understand being so emotional and not wanting to be with a fan for that moment, but he did that. And I thought, you know, I, that only reinforced to me what I think I perceive and like the stories about his dad passing his friends, um, Antoine Hubert and Jules Bianchi and like listening to how his life has really been about motorsports and all these people in his life passing. And I feel like as we watch him right now struggle, and I hope he can get out of this struggle. If, if it's a, a if it's a psychological, I really hope the, the team will get him that the help that he needs because I really want to see him achieve the aspirations that has that I feel like the weight he's probably carrying. And maybe that's some of the stuff that I myself can identify with of people around me expecting me to to achieve and wanting to do that and wanting to always carry myself with a level of humility no matter what I may do because I'm no better than any other person. And I feel I, maybe that's where I feel this affinity with the young kid. Cause I'm, I'm not like some weirdo, you know, like I'm much older than him. So that would just be weird. He's a well, kid. You, you might've caught me, you know, a little bit with that story. That's a great story. I guess. Okay. You can keep being a Charles fan. <laughs> Thank you. You're, but you're right. He does. It, it, that's one of the fun things about this sport too. And you can also show a little bit of your, your teaching background and the whole wanting him to be successful and wanting to mm. you, that. And you and I've talked about this a little bit, like in teaching, when we see kids, I'm using air quotes, but like mm-hmm. in the, the 13 to 18 year old, and these guys are 20, they're not much beyond that, you know, 22, but it's, it's, it's just fun to see human beings grow up and be their best mm-hmm. selves. Right. Mm-hmm. And is. that is part of the fun of this sport. It's a great sport. And so, okay. Charles Leclerc, I do think he has green eyes, but I did not fact check that one. So I was counting on you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to, to disappoint you on that one. I mean, but hey, Fernando, he's closer in age to me. So mm-hmm. that's why I'm like, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, I think I read the other day he's in a relationship. So good for Fernando. Maybe that's, I mean, even that, I love this about the sport. Like someone at that age where, especially now, more than ever where I think ageism 
is actually very real. I love the fact that he's proving that, you know, with the hard work and putting yeah. that discipline in, you can continue to do that, especially with our medical innovation. Now he's got that ability. He could go much longer. And that well, even goes to the stuff that Dick is doing with begin again. And I'm so proud and impressed by his desire to go and pursue his unfinished dreams. Yes. Well, it's encouraging to see folks like a lot. I mean, I, you know, I pick on Alonzo cause I really like him. I think he's handsome. I think he's a great driver. He's been around a long time and I've been a fan since he kind of came on the scene, but it's encouraging to see people doing things like that, to hear about, you're right, what Dick is doing. It's encouraging because it means, you know, the rest of us, we're never too old to keep going and doing and getting involved. And in Fernando's case, to be really like performing at a top level, even if you're getting older, that's, that's, that's encouraging for all of us and whatever we're pursuing in life. So last question. Okay. Now what's more dangerous, the, any Formula One track or Woodall Rogers Freeway in Dallas at rush hour and you're late for a meeting. Oh, Woodall Rogers. Hands down. For sure, right? Hands down. <laughs> the crazies that drive and you're going, <laughs> are you trying to, to kill me? It's like F1. I actually trust those drivers so much more because they have developed their skill. But people that have no business driving are given a driver's license. And I just sit there and I, even today I was driving and I thought this one person, everybody else is going, I would say about eight to 10 miles over the speed limit. But this one person wants to go exactly the speed limit causes everybody to slam on their brakes. I'm going, I understand the law. I do. I'm a lawyer by trade, but right now you are creating an absolute hindrance for all of us and creating a possibility of an accident of someone not paying attention. And yeah. this day and age, more people are not paying attention than they are when they drive, which is a whole nother, we could yeah. go on for an hour of that. Yeah. Well, I want to say thanks for including me. I hope folks have enjoyed listening to us banter. And I uh, really thank you for being such a good sport about being on the receiving end of questions. <laughs> I know that's not fun for you. And I'll uh, let you close out your podcast. How about okay. that? Okay. I was going to say, you're sitting here thanking me, but I got to thank you. First and foremost, thanks for being my friend. I'm really grateful that all of those many years ago, we struck up this friendship, which is now brought developed to what it is today and brought this new chapter in my life. And you also were the friend who welcomed me into your family. And so I I've always felt like I've been adopted in. I can't tell you, thank you enough for sharing the world of racing. And then by extension, now your dad. And then I also have gained another like friend through Dick. So in many ways, our podcast wouldn't be happening but for you and the person that you are. So thank you for that, Rachel. And I'm really glad that the guys thought you would be the person to interview because you know me so well and you're right. It was a very daunting thing to consider that I was going to have to be interviewed, but you made it painless and I've enjoyed it. And if anything, now people get to hear some of our conversations on recording. That ends this conversation. But rest assured, We'll keep talking and you can keep listening in because we're just two guys, a girl, an F1. For John, Dick, and me, thanks for listening. <laughs>